Hi, um, thanks for joining the Arts Experience Online Learning Series today. I'm the moderator for today, Fiki, and here's William. And we're from the Hong Kong New Music Ensemble. And William is the artistic director and I'm the conductor of the ensemble. So today, first, we will talk about some of the art at lunch series that we did in the Hong Kong Arts Center. So we'll be doing six of the programs this year. So let me name all of them first. The first one is John Cage at 100, the music circus. The second one is the minimalists at lunch. And then it will be the silent Chinese silent film project called The Romance of the Western Chamber. And then we will have the old and new, Ligeti and Brahms. After that, we'll have a concert called After Jeswaldo. And to end the whole series, we'll have the Hong Kong composers at lunch. So let's talk about each project one by one. All right. Hey, Vicky. It's quite, quite unusual to be speaking to you in this kind of context because usually we... Um, you know, you're conducting, I'm playing, or, or you know, a different kind of <laughs> circumstance. So right. it's kind of nice to, nice to be in this, um, this situation. Um, yeah, so if we, we chat by one, one by one, you know, we're in extremely grateful for the, to the Hong Kong Art Center for presenting this program. Um, it's really an am amazing opportunity to actually reach out to a, a different kind of audience, which is, you know, you read your usual lunchtime goers who are passing Art Center this this kind of situation um, yeah so we, we found like launching the series in in August with the the John Cage music circus um, yeah it, w it was it was very interesting you know we, we had um, the, the whole idea of uh, music circus is that it, it's all-inclusive you know you can have artists from from different fields like we had poets we had a circus performer we had musicians we had um, what else did we have um, a writer, we had some painters sort of doing some live mm -hmm. painting um, and also we also had a cat you know, one, one of the artists right. brought along a cat, which I, uh, which I didn't find out until the very end, you know and, and, when well, and the audience is also <laughs> yeah, and the o audience sort of started to take part in it it's sort of, uh, and, and young and old, you know um, the whole idea with when, when John Cage put together this music circus was that, you know, it was to last as long as possible and that it was as inclusive as possible, you know. And because it was John, this this year is John Cage's centenary. Um, so he was born in um, 1912. So so actually, yeah, we're just rounding up the year of a lot of centennial activities for the the life of John Cage. And um, yeah, I mean, when when this piece was originally played, it was it was in a, a huge gymnasium. I think hundreds of people took part, you know, and and. And in the past ten years, there have been a few performances, like um, you know, in Canada, in in Australia, in in the U.S. And you know, they they, they each take a very different character. You know, I, I think ours for for the arts uh, art at lunch series would be the shortest in history <laughs> because we were very limited in time. You know, because we could only have fif between fifty and sixty minutes. You know, usually these things go on for for um, you know hours. So right. so so actually, it was quite a unusual. Um, occasion in, in in that sense, but but I think we did have a, a very um, a lot of diversity, but and perhaps the duration is, a, is 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 very symbolic for Hong Kong as well. You know, no one has time to go to a four hour <laughs> performance here. You know, they just have time and lunch, eating a sandwich, and they sort of go out and mm -hmm. and sort of um, and, and see something different. You know, so yeah, that was that was John Cage at a hundred, um, and was part of part of the the ensembles kind of. Um, one one of one of the concerts dedicated to John Cage. Mm -hmm. um, but how did the audience react to that? To that one, I mean, I think we had a lot of a lot of people who 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 knew John Cage and came for him. A lot of people who who came just didn't know what to expect. You know, those people who come and 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 they don't really know what to expect. I think that that's a that's a you know th these are the people we're targeting because new music in Hong Kong really doesn't have a a huge audience. You know, so so the more we can we can, you know, get people get people interested, you know, and also people from different fields, you know. I think I think one of the great things about the Hong Kong creative community 
is that um, you know the the people from different fields interlock and mix um, quite quite often. You know and that's why it was quite easy to sort of ask my painter friends to come along. I knew a, a poet to come along. I knew I knew a guy with a cat. <laughs> a surprise um, to to come along. But these fantastic musicians, fantastic sound artists, and very often, you know, they they have this cage repertoire under the under their fingers or you know, and in their vocal cords already, so that so it's easy to pull out of the hat, you know, and and you know, of course, in in the art community here, John Cage is a very um, familiar name for the for those who don't know him so well. It was it was a, you know a first experience for them, so I hope they you know got a lot out of that. Yeah, and I found it very interesting that they a lot of the audiences start to play. On my instruments, yeah, because I was playing a few instruments back and forth, and people just start to play on it. Well, yeah, well, that's 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 something different to a, a regular <laughs> concert experience, right? Because in a concert experience, you have a stage, and you have the audience. You know, like if you go and see a symphony orchestra, that's what you have. But in something like this, you know, sort of more a gallery feel, you can actually, you know, you have less separation between the public and and the and the the musical creators or the artistic creators, you know. And I'm sure that's something that um, Cage in encouraged, you know. At a, at, you know, there's a w wonderful video, video of Cage sort of, um, you know, making, you know, he, he, he loved, you know, if, if there was um, sort of a, a mistake in the music, he sort of made it his own, you know. And there was a, there was a point where Cage was doing a performance in the States and, and, and there was a, a, a lot of electricity, you know, electrical wires. Um, involved and, and, and at one time, you know, a, a part of his clothing caught on fire, you know, and, and so someone told him during the performance this was happening, and all Cage did was reply, "Oh, isn't it lovely?" <laughs> you know, so that sort of became part of the performance, you know, and in in, in a way, you know, in if, if if members of the general public sort of come up and start playing the instruments, you know, if they look at the score and see Cage. You know, um, and try and interpret it. That that's also an inclusive experience yeah, in the spirit of a music music circus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how about we go on to the second concert? Okay. Well, the second one was called the Minimalists at Lunch, Oops. <laughs> which was um, basically a tribute to basically the, the, the movement that started, um, you know, roughly fifty years ago. Um, the Michael Nyman, <coughs> Michael Nyman origi originally coined the phrase, you know, and we have great works like Terry Riley's and C, you know, which kind of, you know, get the movement forward and, um, yeah. But but our, our concert was sort of dedicated to um, two major figures of this movement, um, plus two who are sort of less known. So the two major figures were Philip Glass and Steve Reich. So we did the second string quartet by Philip Glass and Steve Reich's violin phase. And then we we took a, a Hong Kong composer. Well, I'm not sure if he'd call himself a composer even. You know, he's sort of an audio visual artist. A some DJ. Pe some people call him a DJ. He hates that term, you know. <laughs> but we, we we lined him up with a string quartet and a and a um, someone to sort of notate his music in the in this summer to sort of um, where he could uh, improvise on laptop and, and different in electronic instruments and play live with a string quartet. So actually we, we played a string quartet rendition of this piece, which is it's actually quite minimalist in feel as well. <coughs> and, that, and that guy's name is um, Choi Sai Ho, and he's you know, the, the Hong Kong representative out of our minimalist program. Um, and then with them the, the last work was, was by a Dutch composer, Louis Andresen. And, and most people wouldn't, wouldn't coin him a minimalist, but he's greatly influenced by, by this movement. So the piece, um, Workers' Union, which was actually your choice, <laughs> um, from 1967, I think. Um, you know, I mean, we, we don't have actual pictures of the music notated, but, you know, the rhythmic drive, you know, there's a lot of, lot of um, minimalist fervor in there where, you know, we kind of, um, you know, we, we, we get the spirit of, you know, repetition. And, but, but really what, what the piece is is what we make it, right? You were playing right. a lot of a lot of drums in that piece, you know, and I mean, it, it it could have been a completely different piece with with different performers, you know, mm -hmm. or we could have chosen to do it in a completely different way, yeah. Um, but yeah, Louis Andreessen was a you know a fantastic 
well, still is, he's still, still alive. Um, fantastic example of, of just harnessing so many different styles in his music. So, you know, and, it, and you'd long wanted to, to, to do this piece, so. Well, we it's a nice piece. It's a gorgeous piece, yeah. But uh, in case some of the people watching are new to this music, can you talk about what's minimalist music? Just talk a little bit. Well, about I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard minimalist music. You know, if, you, if you've heard any, um, you know, someone like Philip Glass, or if people know the, the piano, you know, this film called The Piano. Um, I mean, that was composed by Michael Nyman, the, the music for that, you know. I mean, a lot of the film music in Hollywood or maybe a little, little more alternative blockbusters, um, you know, Philip Glass has written a lot of the music for, um, who's, you know, kind of huge fig figure in minimalism. Um, and actually his, um, his opera, Einstein and Beach, is coming to Hong Kong next year right. for, the, for the Arts Festival, which is... Um, yeah, and but but given an, you know what is minimalism? I mean, it, it's taking taking music down to its its essence. You know, kind of um, if you have one chord, you know, I mean, you can spread it over 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 you know several several minutes or, or even even an hour. You know, before changing to a new chord in, in simple terms. You know, or or it can be a harmonic structure that is sort of pushed to its limit, where you really, you know, when when this movement sort of took off, it was it was about Okay, we, we, we bring music back to its essence, you know, because music after World War Two, World War Two, you know, it sort of, you know, the whole um, um, sort of serialist um, way music was heading, you know, after the after the Second World War and with after after Schoenberg, you know, I, I guess it came after that, you know, that that there are a lot of composers who who were wanting wanting something a little um, okay, I I can't. I can't push twelve tone music mm -hmm. any anything any any more, you know. Arvo Pert is a great example of that, you know. He's kind of called you know, kind of in the school as well. Um he started out writing, you know, quite complex music, mm -hmm. but then he gets to at the point, you know, he doesn't compose for ten years and he comes out with these beautiful sounds and I'm sure people people listening here today, I'm sure I'm sure everyone would have heard at some some time some of Arvo Pert's music. Um, even if it's just on the radio or, or in a certain scene in a movie, you know, it's, it's you know, it's 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 kind of infu infiltrated the popular culture in a way, kind of by accident, mm -hmm. you know, because it is just <coughs> a little bit more accessible. But are there any like pop singers or pop artists, musicians that were influenced by minimalist? Yeah, totally, totally. There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful. Well, I'm. There's a wonderful inter interview with Arvo Pert and and Bjork, oh, right. and um, she's you know she's just you know highly inspired by by these these minimalists, particularly Arvo Pert, you know, um, and yeah, of, of course it infil infiltrates to so many pop scenes. I'm not sure so much in Hong Kong and China, um, but you know if you, if you go to the scenes in in Iceland, you know there's a there's a label called Bedroom Community label, you know, and they work with a, you know, a lot of um, sort of, I mean, they've, they've called them the post-minimalists, you know, I guess, that they, they're in, um, you know, people like Ben Frost and Nico Mooley, these kind of guys, um, the Icelandic guys, I can't, I can't pronounce their names, so I don't remember them, um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're highly influenced by the New York downtown school, you know, which is kind of, you know, the heartbed of minimalism in a way. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, there are there particularly in the last last twenty thirty years, there's a lot of crossover <coughs> between so many different art forms, so and, and and different genres of music. So it's, it's inevitable, you mm -hmm. know, particularly with the iPod and digital music <laughs> these days. We don't have to buy buy CDs anymore. You know, it's it's kind of um, you know, and what people listen to. You know, so many people go to the movies. Half the time, we don't know what we're listening to. You know. So, so with minimal music, I, I'm sure most people most people have listened to it, even if they can't put a name to it. So, but there are some great masterworks of that repertoire, and that's what we've kind of we we tried to put together for the the Art at Lunch series at Art Center. So, going from crossovers and 
movies. Now we have a Chinese silent film project. Right. So that's coming up in January. Right. You're conducting right. it. In yeah. a few weeks. In a, in a couple of weeks, we're <laughs> starting, starting rehearsals. Um, so, yeah, it's in the new year. It's, it's a fantastic film from 1927, the year my grandfather was born. This <laughs> film came out in Shanghai um, called Romance of the Western Chamber. And, you know, this was the heyday of, of silent film in, 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 in China, basically. Um, you had a, f you know, it, it, it had even started in Hong Kong bef before this time, you know. But this, this particular film was chosen by the composer we commissioned to write the piece, Chan Ming Chi. And we haven't seen much of the music yet, so <laughs> actually we don't know what it's, what it, what it's going to sound like. But, uh, but I think it'll be in the spirit of, of sort of more accessible um, a more accessible approach to film and interpreting visual image. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the first silent film project that the ensemble's done. I mean, we did sort of a, a Charlie Chaplin project last, last January, so almost two years ago now, um, which was hugely su successful. I mean, people love Charlie Chaplin, you know, and, um, and what's, the, what's the other one we did? Yeah, there was a, there was a it was a French silent film that they presented as a part of an Osage Sigma series called uh, Men of Monton, I think it was called. By, um, I can't remember if it's French or Russian. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, this whole era, era of, of, of new scores for silent film is kind of, kind of, kind of you know, com coming of age, particularly as, as we have the, the technology to, to be able to, you know, um, kind of work with, you know, we're, we're not working with reels, you know, we can digitalize um, the films we, we come into contact with. And they're, they're more, you know, they're more widely accessible, you know. I mean, these, these, these obscure films from 1920s Shanghai you can find in a, um, you know, just online, you know, or, or you know, or contact the, the Beijing Film Archive very easily these days. So, so actually the accessibility of these new films are... Uh, 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 you know, it's, it's becoming more wide. And, and people start to rediscover these old movies, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, was it the, 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 the last year, the, the Fritz Lang, um, what's it called? The, the Metropolis. Metropolis. You all know? of its other stuff. Exactly. So with Metropolis, you know, that was hugely successful, successful as part of the Hong Kong International Film Festival. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sold out, you know, and they they'd newly found these these undiscovered reels, you know, mm -hmm. they, could, they could bring it to life, you know. And, you know, hopefully that's, that's what we'll, we'll do with the next project in January, with this Shanghai this silent film. Famous film also, I think. Yeah, it's also famous, but, but not outside China. But I thought it went to France. Mm -hmm. Because when I saw the movie, it, these subtitles are in French. See, this is the French connection in Shanghai. You know how there's a, a French quarter in Shanghai? Uh -huh. you know, it was a, um, I suppose it was the, the Chinese filmmaker's attempt to, to, to be a little bourgeois, you know. And yeah, you have a huge, this was, this was a time in Shanghai that was, it was a you know, pre-civil war in China. So you have, you know, you have an amazing energy. You know, the latest Hollywood films are coming in. You have a huge jazz scene there. You know, um, and actually, the cafe life was thriving. You know, it, w it was it was a, it was a time of, of huge intellectual fervor. You know, of of quiet um, liberal thinking. So, and a, and actually, as a um, as a project after after the the art center performance, we we're, we're actually recreating a, a Shanghai tea ha a Shanghai cafe in a, in in the new music ensemble laboratory. Southside, so we'll, we'll actually be tr trying to recreate a Shanghai cafe in the 1920s, and you know, we'll have storytelling, we'll have the, the film showing, we'll have um, you know, it's a, it's a place where you know, if there's a latest circus performer in town, you, you bring them out. You know, if you have um, you know someone who wants to read aloud something of a, of a new of a new um, a new book they've just written, you know, these are the places where people gather. You know, it's rare to find that in in Hong Kong these days, right? It's old style of multimedia. Yeah, exactly. It's not high tech, it's just reading and performing. Yeah, and I mean, if you read um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's books, you know, a lot of them are you know, based in, you know, in these cafes in South America, lined with books, 
where you know the the intellectuals of the day come you know where, which you know it's a li- it's a little highbrow you know but they sit down they're they're you know, probably jobless <laughs> and and they they kind of they they discuss about life they discuss about you know the issues of the de- of the day you know so we'll we'll be exploring ways that you know okay we can be nostalgic for the past but Maybe sometimes bringing bringing something from the past is is a good thing, you know, and and also it, it it's a form of really great entertainment. You know, you've got silent film, you've got music, you've got circus, you've got storytelling, and also fine dining. So we'll have uh, you know some fantastic um, food being served to our our guests that night. So hopefully that'll be a interesting experience. So that so that's in late January, as well after the art center performance cool. of this piece. So sort of giving a new an old film with new score, mm-hmm. a different context. Cool. So, old and new. It's the t- another title for another project. Mm-hmm. Uh, right after the sound film, it's the Ligeti and Brahms, yeah. two of the great composers. Well, totally. I mean, most people would know about Brahms, but I think very few in Hong Kong would know about Ligeti. Would you say? Maybe. He's, he's less known. I mean, not many of the orchestras here perform his work so often. The chamber works, not so much. I mean, maybe maybe some people may know his metronome piece, you know, where you've got a, what is it, 101 metronome sort of? Yeah. You know, it's sort of an installation art piece when Ligeti was involved in the, the Fluxus movement. Um, but, 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 yeah. Everyone should go and have a look on YouTube. Exactly. Just exactly. search Ligeti metronome. Yeah. And you'll find it. And actually, Ligeti's music was featured in um, was Kubrick's film um, 2001 Space Odyssey. Right. Without his permission. So, so actually, if you've seen this film, you would have heard Ligeti's music. And it as a result of that. And it fits. And it fits. And so it's perfect for it, you know. So, so actually, this is a case as well where maybe you don't know the name, but actually you, you know the music. Um... In this case, uh, the the program at Art Center, it's it's taking two masterworks of the horn trio repertoire. So we have a, a fantastic horn trio by Brahms, you know, who sort of established the the genre. And Ligeti was greatly influenced by Brahms's um, horn trio, so he 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 wrote another one. Um, and yeah, this is, is it's very much a companion piece. I mean, we in the art center performance, we won't do the the whole works, but sort of excerpts and sort of talk a little bit, explain linkages between both pieces and how, you know, two two composers separated by, you know, quite a, quite a long period of time can write for the same combination of instruments in in very different ways. So yeah, and and I think the the listeners will 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 hear similarities between them. They'll, they'll also, you know, they'll, they'll hear this, this 150 years between them, you know, it'll, it'll be a real, it'll re- be a real um, beautiful experience, I think, for listeners. Yeah, they will he- hear different sounds with the different, well, it's the same setting, but different sound, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and really you're listening to history, you know, you're mm-hmm. listening to 100 years of musical thought. All right, what separated these composers, you know, it was, you know, um, Brahms was in the midst of, uh, you know, the Romantic era, and Ligeti is in, you know, in the, the you know, I think at that time, um, you know, uh, after the Second World War, you know, so, so they're, they're separated by a huge chunk of history, you know, and it's how this chunk of, both both musical history and you know physical, uh, you know, world history affected the way people composed, you know, so this is why it's kind of old and new, you know, you can do many different ways, old and new, but when you're taking the two, two, two works with exactly the same combination of instruments, it, it, it gets interesting. So we'll be exploring, exploring that in that concert. And people will learn a lot, I guess. Well, I, ho- I hope so. You know, I mean, for, for all, all the Art at Lunch programs that we're doing at Art Center, it's not, you have to be, come from a certain background to appreciate the music. You know, you, you can come, you can come in off the street, you know. I mean, you can be a homeless person off the street, and hopefully, you know, you understand, you you appreciate something in in the music, and it can touch you, you know. Um, and that's that's why you know that that it's quite a diverse range of of musical offerings that that we've put together for Out of Lunch. Um, that it's 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 not your just common chamber music program, 
it, it's, it's something that, that is different every time, but might appeal to, to different kinds of audiences each time. And I'm surprised every time there's, oh, it's almost full house. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's there's good. There's a lot of people coming. That's, that's due to the art center, I think. <laughs> yeah. Very good publicity, which, which is, uh, which is um, yeah, I mean, to get people to these kinds of shows in Europe and US and Australia, I mean, it, 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 it is difficult. But what we have in Hong Kong is something, something a bit fresh. You know, we don't, we don't have, we don't have a, um, you know, a bit of historical baggage that we have in other places. So, you know, people, people are less fixed on what they like, what they don't like, mm -hmm. which is, can be good, you know. It now is the time to sort of, sort of, um, you know, off, offer something fresh in the audience's palate, you know, which I hope we're doing. <laughs> yeah, and with <coughs> well, again, we'll have another old and new concert, right? Mm -hmm. The after Jeswaldo. Yeah, yeah. This will. I can't remember the exact date. I think it's. Um, you can find find offline. I think it's July. Yeah, ar around this time. So we've we've still got a bit of time to plan. I mean, we did an after Jeswaldo concert last year with the with the um, Hong Kong Bar Choir. You also performed, right? Yeah. You were performing, and and that that I'll just explain a little bit about that piece and the the, the background. Um, Carlo Gesualdo was an amazing sort of um, late Renaissance composer who composed what in the time was extremely avant-garde music. You know, like the very very high jumps, very you know quite dissonant chords. You know, um, and he he was most famous for for murdering his wife and his wife's lover. You know, that's how most people remember Jeswaldo. And he's is famous because of this. Werner Herzog made a movie about Jeswaldo's life, which is fantastic if you <laughs> Not about the music, it. just the killing. Well, it it features the music, you know. It's a, actually a fantastic film, you know. It's a, it's very Herzog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you get a lot of this um you know, the, the he's one of the unique characters in history, I think, Jeswaldo. And even though people remember him as a murderer you know, you listen to his music. You know, he was he was a, he was a Italian nobleman. You listen to his music, and there's just something in the divine there. You know, so he must have repented later, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the the pieces we featured um, earlier in April in our previous concert were the Holy Responsatories for Holy Saturday, and we did it on Holy Saturday. You know, he w in in the end, Jeswaldo well, was a Catholic composer, and the Bach Choir of Hong Kong performed you know, um, selections from his holy res uh, responsatories. Combined with, and this, this is where the after Jezwaldo sort of come, comes into play. This was combined with sort of Hong Kong composers interacting with, with Jezwaldo's music. And they each composed, you know, certain, um, some of them were reflections or in, uh, pieces that were influenced by, um, by, Jeswaldo's music directly, or it could have been inspired by East or inspired by a certain text that Jeswaldo used. But each each of them, you know, sort of took um, took that 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 springboard to create something new. And so it was a really beautiful concert. We were in Sai Kung in the Yim Tin Sai um, Yim Tin Sai Island in, in Saint Joseph's Chapel, and it was the first ever concert that was held on this very remote Catholic ch in this remote Catholic church. And the whole process of interacting with the islanders, of, of, of chatting to, um, le learning about the history of the island, you know, um, was really inspiring. And we brought, brought the audience there by boat, and we gave them a meal, and we gave them a concert, and then sent them back to Central, you know. So it was all about the experience of, of going to an island, experiencing something new, and going back to, 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 to your, you know, w I guess the, the the hassles of everyday life, you know, presenting a, a kind of um, um, something different to that. Mm -hmm. And the concert featured t uh, some special instruments, also some instruments yeah, that yeah. we don't hear every day. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had the viola da gamba, um, viola da gamba soloist, and um, Lam Tim Wire, wonderful local guy. And yeah, I mean, each of the composers, most of them wrote for. for for him as soloist, sort of, you know, an instrument that was used in Jeswaldo's time. 
And in fact, the concert at Art Center, I do, I do want to incorporate that idea of you know sort of older instruments reinterpreting Jez Wilder's music. So in in the the next concert after Jez Wildo at, at Art Center, we do want to. I mean, the idea for that is to um, perform music rearrangements of Jez Wildo. Um, Hong Kong composers in interpreting Jez Wildo in a new way. So we'll repeat some of the pieces we did before, but al also going with you know the idea of okay, what you know we have Jez Wildo who who was an Italian nobleman. There's another composer, Giancinto Scelsi, who, who um, you know, at the turn of last century was born. He was also, you know, an aristocrat in Italy and also composed the most amazing music, you know. Um, so we're sort of taking these two, two major figures of uh, Italian, um, Italian music and sort of, yeah, rethinking them, sort of thinking them anew. So my, my idea for that concert is, you know, we, we have the Dagamba, we have, we have um, some music by Jez Wilder arrangements, modern interpretations, and also these modern pieces by Chelsea, which are amazing. You know, you have, um, they're for solo instruments or duos, but they were conceived with uh, performers improvising, improvising on their instruments, and uh, ascribe, you know, Chelsea was incredibly rich. He, ha he had someone actually notating what the improvisers were were playing, and that was his music, you know. So it, he didn't even write it. Well, he directed it, you know. He was a, he was he was he had had the luxury of doing that. But it, it's kind of like a lot of artists in China, you know, they don't make their own artwork, you know. These these, you know, these these huge sculptures, you know, they they have a team of of people sort of building building their vision for them. You know, this this was kind of like Chelsea, you know. He had a team of musicians who he paid. Fantastic resources ascribed to sort of write down his music and comes out with the most amazing music. Um, and Chelsea, just like Giswaldo, you know, was kind of cast off in his lifetime. And it's just starting to um, be recognized in Italy. So the orchestras are just starting to play his music. People are starting just to appreciate um, uh, his, his works these days. So, it, so it's an incredibly interesting connection between Jezwaldo and Chelsea and, and and this concert will explore it a bit and hopefully we can do it as an ensemble as well sort of um, particularly perform more of Chelsea's music I think it's, it's very worthy and get get some local local comp composers to sort of um, you know use it as a springboard for for for, for ideas you know of course of course each composer has their original you know inspiration I mean that's that's natural but you know, we, we're all inspired by something, you know, and by presenting something in a new context, maybe it will be the springboard to, to something new. So hopefully that's what we'll achieve through that concert. Yeah. Right. So our last concert, it's the only concert that features, well, not the only, maybe one of the two concerts that features local composers. And only local composers. Right. So, so this one I've, I've actually given to... Um, you know, I mean, I, I chatted to Clarence Mack, you know, who's, who's the, the head of composition at, at APA. And I said, okay, I give you a concert. All right, we'll, we'll perform the music, but I, w I want you to curate the concert. Like, put together works by local composers who you think sort of work well together, you know. It's not about politics. You know, they can be your students. They can be people you admire, but they're kind of, you know, they work well together, and they represent the diversity of Hong Kong contemporary music. Because there are there are a lot of comp you know um, performances of Hong Kong works, even though there aren't enough, but there are, there are a lot. But usually they they're presented in a very haphazard, disorganized fashion, one work after the next. You know, but what if there's a theme for the concert? What if there's, you know, there's, um, you know, that maybe the composer is given limitations, maybe they're not. You know, but it, it's very well thought out, and the the audience comes away from that concert thinking, okay, even though there are quite a number of composers in there. there. There's a unified theme and the concert actually worked, you know. Um, because there, there, are, there are a lot of composers in Hong Kong, you know. We, mm -hmm. we start off with, you know, who's considered the father of contemporary music, Doming Lam, you know, but, you know, and he, he's, he's still alive, you know, but, but under him there are a number of generations 
of um, fantastic composers, local talents, you know. A lot of them are teaching full-time. There are very few full-time composers in Hong Kong. Hopefully we can change that, you know, by, by actually providing opportunities um, by, you know, to have a composer in residence mm -hmm. in, in some seasons, you know, to be actually, actually be able to support local talent to be able to compose full-time because actually very few composers here compose full-time. Um, yeah, but going down from Doming Lam, we have, you know, the, you know, the generation of Richard Chang, and, uh, Chan, um, Chan Hing Yan, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Victor Chan. And, and what's most exciting, you know, is the younger generation of composers coming up. You know, and a lot of those studied abroad, you know, and they've come back to Hong Kong. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to do stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of them are still overseas. Given the right environment in Hong Kong, I think they'll, they'll come back and really can contribute to the local community here. But we already have, you know, a lot of great composers who have come back and are already contributing, you know. I mean, we've got um, Samson Young, who just finished his doctorate at, at Princeton University, and um, Ainan Lu's come back from Columbia, where he did his doctorate, and he's running a successful art gallery now. Uh, with, um, you know, Tang Lok Yin, come back from, you know, some time at Columbia as well, and, you know, is writing a lot for dance, and, you know, I mean, there's so much cultural, uh, so, so much creative energy with the, the local composer community. But it's getting that, keeping that spirit and, and, and creating opportunities for them. Um, so, hope, hope, I mean, th this concert plays a very small part in that. But ho hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll be something new. It'll mm -hmm. be, there'll, there'll be completely new works or, or works speci specifically chosen by, by Clarence Mack. And yeah, sort of ha have a have a theme, have a have a unifying element that you know that may you know open up people's ears to a new kind of music, which is Hong Kong music that that belongs here. You know, it's not it's not something imported. You know, Hong Kong is is incredibly east 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 meets west. You know, but as a result of that, you know, um, people think that all right, we we imitate to. To to be like the West, therefore, will be good. But actually, we've got a lot of lot of local history here. We've got so much so much talent that you know it's it's about finding finding our own voice as Hong Kongers, I guess. And and that that'll come by just being more confident, you know. And I think our, our ensemble can play play a part in that just by offering opportunities and giving, you know, if, if it's musicians or or composers the the confidence to be to be able to express themselves and to and to, to be able to do that more regularly. So I think yeah, that's that's the idea behind that, <laughs> even though it's a long yeah, and long way to down pe answer. Let people know about they are actually composers in Hong Kong. Yeah. And not just the composing pop singers. Yeah, I mean and usually the 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 ones who write for, for, for pop music, you know, they're academically trained as well. You know, that that's a that's a very um, important part of the creative creative life here. You know, we live in a very commercial city. Um, but then you have, I don't know, you know, you can you can live many worlds. You know, you have composers like Mchekin, you know, who runs mm -hmm. Apple Tree Music, but you know he can write very academic music. But you know, he has his own band, which is which is you know actually very very downtown New York. I kind of like it for that. You know, but but it's he's creating his own scene. You know, he d he doesn't worry about what people say, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a very good thing, and it adds to the di diversity of what's happening here. Um, and composers can go through that in many different ways, you know, Law Wing Fai um, just wrote the new film score for the, the recent um, An Hoi film with Andy Lau, you know, so actually people in Venice, people, you know, in other parts of the world heard, you know, Law Wing Fai's music. Even if you know that it's it's not a, a very conscious um, thing, but it but it you know peop people here um, you know globally a lot of what's happening in Hong Kong even if they mm -hmm. can't put a finger on oh, that's Hong Kong music you know but I th I think that that confidence will will come out Just give Hong Kong a couple of decades <laughs> so uh, let's see. So we talked about audience in interactions with all the concerts. Mm -hmm. How does 
the ensemble members like the concerts. Mm-hmm. Right, we don't Do have you have any feedback? Ensemble members. Well, yeah, I mean, we want to get a lot of a lot of ensemble input. You know, we're just trying to grow grow a, a, a core group of players who are really, you know, in tune to the vision of, um, you know, growing growing a steady steady group. Um, and at the moment, you know, peop- certain certain people like to, you know, they ha- they have their area of speciality of what they really like to do, and I try and encourage that. Um, yeah, but it, but I think. So many, you, you can't be a member of a new music ensemble and be too closed, don't, don't you think? If you, if you, if you say, um, oh, I don't do that, then, you know, I mean, the, the, the spirit of, of innovation is, is, a very, is a very open question. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the, at the moment in the ensemble's development, I mean, I, I think all the, all, the, all the members are kind of very, very open in that sense. And... Well, I hope they like it. <laughs> <laughs> hope they like it. You know, and and, and it does. It it's definitely di- different to playing in an orchestra, right? You know, because that can that can get to a grind. You know, there are only certain number of eroica symphonies you can do in a season and still bring out something fresh. Um, but you know, I mean, what what we're doing, you know, is usually, you know, say a minimalist concert. You know, I mean. I don't think the Steve Rack violin phase has been performed here so often, you know, and u- and usually the members know that they are doing a premiere, you know, they are doing something that hasn't been heard in Hong Kong before. And because of that, they better do a good job at it because, you know, goodness knows when the next time will be, you know. And I- if they don't convince people this time, there won't be a next time, you know. So hopefully that, that spirit of of collectiveness and, and, and um, passion for what they're doing does does bleed over into into their attitude towards the music. So I hope we have that. In the and all the concerts were so so close to the audience too. Yeah. You can see all their reactions while we're performing. Yeah. It's quite different when we play on stage with the audience on the floor. Yeah, I mean I mean we do we do, do a lot of the sort of concert hall audience ensemble kind of concerts and, and they're they're great. I mean they're they're there are sometimes when you can only really experience the music that way when it's completely quiet, where it's um, when you've got the optimal sort of concert hall acoustics. Because I mean, a lot of the acoustics we play in are terrible, you know. Or if we're performing outside, I mean, forget acoustics; they don't even exist. Um, so I mean, like we're putting together a big lig- ligeti program at the moment, you know, and it's you know I can't envisage that in a gallery. You know, you need really optimal acoustics. You need the best acoustics in Hong Kong. So the people are able to hear, you know, when the flute plays that note, you can hear it, you know. If you're in another acoustic, it'll, it'll just be lost. So, yeah, it, it's, it's really about choosing your location for performance as well, as well, you know. Um, you know, we recently did the sha- Sound Shocking um, project, which is an amazing thing we did at Artistry. And, you know, I mean, part of the project was filming musicians in sort of different um, pub, um, pub, uh, public spaces in Hong Kong. So actually, you know, we have a, a solo vocalist performing Berio, an Italian modernist, in the train. You know, and we, we filmed people's reactions, and we, <laughs> we got some really good ones, you know. But as for presenting that, I mean, they c- the audience couldn't hear a thing. You know, so it was really about... Um, you know, the, the best presentation for that was to record the video of it being done outside and to bring it into artistry, which is sort of a more gallery setting, a more concert hall setting. So in that sense, it's, it's sort of, yeah, you still need to ch- choose your locations very carefully. So do you think the whole Art and Lunch series is helps how the ensemble will h- to achieve their goal, their vision? Yeah, I think so. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I think it's about representing um, a di- diversity of contemporary music. And also the fact that contemporary music is extremely diverse. And collaborative. You know, I, through each of these programs, each of them is kind of, well, less so with the, the ones further along. But the 
you know, the, the music circus, the first one, and the silent film project, I mean, they, they reach into other, other art forms. You know, and that's one thing that contemporary music can do very easily, and that our ensemble can do very easily. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of, yeah, it's, a, it's achieved its, its purpose. I'm very grateful that we're able to present, you know, six very, very different <laughs> programs and to be able to get away with it, you know. Because mm -hmm. I, I think if we're, and, and they're small programs, you know, they're experimental programs. You know, we couldn't do this with an orchestra. It's too risky, you know. Um, well, I, I still think it can be. Yeah, but having a, a whole program of, of Hong Kong composers with a full orchestra program, I mean, forget it, you'll lose too much money. But in chamber music, um, you know, I mean, it, it is smaller scale. It's more intense. It's closer to your audience. It's, it's more, I mean, in a way, interactive. You know, it's, there's less separation between creator and receiver, in that case, the audience, you know, that you can actually, you know, become part of the process. And that's, that's a good thing about doing these kind of small, um, small experimental style music projects. So um, we've done a lot of them. Hopefully, you know, I, I, I do want to get, you know, for programs to sort of get bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but th but these, are, these are great to start with, you know. The ensemble's only four years old, so it's um, still in its infancy. <laughs> um, you know, once we've done these and, and find our voice, you know, we can sort of get into you know, a lot of bigger repertoire and to be able to, to, to really pull it off with, with, um, with, with style and with having come from this. Yeah, I've, I've forgotten the question. So, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> we can go on to another <laughs> question, but um, <coughs> as we are always playing li works by living composers, I think it's a very good way that we work with them while rehearsing the piece to get their vision. Yeah. Instead of well, with August when orchestra plays Beethoven, mm. usually only the conductor takes the idea and gives it out to the ensemble yeah and it might not be what Beethoven wanted yeah so in this new new kind of world the high technology everything needs to be precise and yeah so that might be better in a way that's how I think because mm -hmm. we're we know what the creator wanted and we try to just recreate it yeah or or make it part of part of us that we take on the piece. I mean, it happens with Beethoven too, for sure. If you're a conductor interpreting a Beethoven symphony, you don't have you don't have the composer there, but you have to you have to read a lot, right? You have to do a lot of score study. You have to go to the symphony before, the symphony after. Have 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 that baggage of of um, of actually knowing Beethoven, even though you don't know him. You know, I mean, sometimes you may not want, um, you know, in the rehearsal process, it takes a lot longer when the composer's there. We, we know that, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's a good thing, you know. If the, and if the, the players, they get the music better, that's a good thing. If the audience then gets the music better, that's a good thing. Well, so. because these music, it's, it's so complex, sometimes we don't have enough time to get into the tiniest detail. Exactly. We might need their help and guide us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's one thing that a lot of people don't mm -hmm. realize about contemporary music, that even though, okay, the piece is just 10 minutes long, why do you need 10 re rehearsals for that 10 minutes? You know, In an orchestra, you know, if it's a symphony, say by Sibelius, all right, a 10-minute ten, ten movement, okay, you don't, need that much rehearsal for that. <laughs> but in contemporary music, if it's something like Zanarkis or Schoenberg or, or I mean, Ligeti, I mean, you could, you could easily have 10 rehearsals of that piece and not get, you know, if there's so much detail, or if it's Fernie how I mean, um, you know, he, he sort of says, well, if you, if you get 80% of my notes, then <laughs> you're doing well. <laughs> you know, you have composers who write so many notes, you can't even play them. Um, but with contemporary music, yeah, I mean, y you do need, look, need to put it a lot of time in. If the time isn't there, I think people hear it. So that's one of the challenges we, we have. I mean, we have very limited public funding. 
I mean, we're very grateful for the funding we, we received. But, um, you know, I mean, the amount of time, the amount of money we're given and the amount of time we need is just not enough. So we're, we're you know, pushing the envelope as much as we can to get the quality we want and to get, you know, the, the, the level of performance that is needed. You know, in all these programs as well for Art Center, you know, I mean, for the silent film project, it's 50 minutes of music nonstop. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, that's that's a lot of music. <laughs> you know, that's that's two two Haydn symphonies. You know, for a very small ensemble. And if someone plays a wrong note in that ensemble, everybody knows about it. You know, it's not like a like a symphony orchestra. You know, maybe it'll be covered up if a if a bass player kind of messes up a note, but not in uh, in an ensemble where every member is so important. You know, that we're all soloists. You mm -hmm. know. That's why. That's why in Europe, you know, if you're a member of an ensemble, you're not. You're not just a member. You're a, you know, the solo violinist, solo violist, solo pianist. You know, that's the that's the level. Um, and actually, the big challenge in in Hong Kong is to, to to get people to commit to that. That's a huge commitment. You know, when in a very busy city. So I think that that'll be the next stage where we where we take things to sort of, to sort of. Um, um, yeah, just really to allow more time to, to, to grow a, co a coherent sound in, in, in um, you know, by taking, taking a lot more time to, to prepare for programs. But do you think the time it's worth to do it? Well, with so much time on each piece? Sometimes, yes. I mean, y some, peop some pieces, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, uh, we kind of... We play play a lot of stuff, you know. We we get through a lot, right? I mean, just in this this season, I mean, it's been about five concerts a month, you know. Mm -hmm. So some of them very small, but in those very small concerts, I mean, there could be in a massive amount of preparation. Um, but as the ensemble find finds its voice, I think we can, you know, we select what we do very carefully. But how about for the audience? Because sometimes I talk to people, they find it it's not worth going to a new music concert because they don't understand the music. Well, that, well, this is, I mean, if we go to, I mean, the next question is about what's, what's planned in, you know, the next season. There's a lot of education, education activities. And actually, the Art Center performance e is an education activity in that way, you know, because there, there is an opportunity to ask questions. There are great program notes. You know, you go in not needing to know anything. Um, but you can stay behind and chat to the players, chat to the conductor, chat to the composers after the concert's finished. You know, that, you know, it, it's actually very accessible. You know, I, I don't go much for this argument that contemporary music isn't accessible, <laughs> that you need a huge amount of, of, of prior knowledge to appreciate it. I think it's, if it's performed well, if you come in with an open mind, then it's no, th there's, there's no reason not to appreciate it. You may not like it, but that's something else. You know, if if it, it's about people taking something seriously, you know, uh, having a serious audience goer is just the same as being a serious performer or a serious composer. You know that that you you take what you do. You know, time is precious in Hong Kong. If you go and see a performance, you know that's your time. That's valuable time taken away that you might be, you know, spending time with your family and, and stuff. You know, um, you know so. And we also need to respect that, you know, when we perform. You know, we, if we've got 100 people there, that's 100 evenings we've taken away from people. <laughs> so we, we, we have a, um, a mandate to really present them the best we can in the best possible way. And I think, well, a lot of people go to art galleries and look at contemporary art. Is it easier for people to get a visual concept than from their ears? by listening to contemporary music, because they're pretty much similar, because they're all new. Totally, you know, and that's, our first concert in Hong Kong was in an art gallery. It was with the art crowd. Mm -hmm. There's some curiosity there. And now I'm working with an art gallery to run our, our venue, you know, so we, we, we share the space with an art gallery. Um, yes, there are, it can be basically the same thing if a paint, you know, if there's a painter drawing a piece of contemporary art, and a composer who's writing a piece of contemporary music, it's the same process. Um, and but yeah, I mean, but the products are different, you know. I mean, the whole idea of 
hanging a painting on the wall and appreciating appreci appreciating it like that is different to putting on a pair of, a pair of headphones or going to a concert. One um, one element of that is that you can step away from the painting. You don't have to be with it for 10 minutes if you don't like it. You just step away and go to the other one. Chat to your friend, have a drink of wine at the opening. You know, you can't do that with a piece of contemporary music. If you're going to appreciate it, you know, you have to listen to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And when that piece is an hour long, and you don't know if you'll like it until the, the, the end of the 60th minute, or the end of the 59th minute, then that's, that's a lot of time. It's actually more commit. Uh, it can be more commitment to appreciate contemporary music, and that's why it's some. That's why it is less popular, and it, and that's always been the case. But are there any composers that people can listen to to start them off? Actually, actually, the minimalists, you know. Um, actually, you know, the the. Just by yeah, I mean, just just, it, it's kind of like a maze, you know. If there's one composer you like, find out who that composer is similar to, you know, and you can kind of kind of work around and you know, in the in the end you kind of find find your 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 taste. But at the moment a lot of people to sort of either don't know or are not interested to find their taste within contemporary music. Where, whereas, you know, if you know the the concerts we do are widely popular in 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 Europe, you know. Um, particularly the more accessible ones, you know. If you go to these uh, clubs in, in London, you know, they're presenting classical music, you know. Mm -hmm. um, or a, a venue like um, the Roundhouse in London. Amazing youth venue. But, you know, they, they do some experimental stuff and, you know, they, they are attracting a lot of young people. A lot of young people who wouldn't usually listen to, to these kind of sounds. But it's, it's more accessible to them because they, they come from... You know, we all come with a cultural baggage. In this case, the cultural baggage of those young people are, you know, hip hop, rap, you know, popular, you know, all, a lot of forms of popular music and rock. But these days, a lot of composers are writing mm -hmm. with those backgrounds as well. So that's where we do have relevance because that's that's our audience. Those people who come from those backgrounds, the same, um, the same audiences as those composers are coming from. Right, like the concert we did last year with the with a Berlin ensemble. Mm -hmm. One of the composers are actually a electronic music artist. Yeah. And he came last week, no, two weeks ago yeah. from to the music festival. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean that that was called synchronizing Hong Kong Berlin. So we had a composer on one end in Berlin, um, and a composer in Hong Kong. With you conducting, um, and a very super high, uh, high speed internet line, and and two ensembles either side, so each composer wrote for each, each ensemble. Yeah, but you, you know, someone who is you know by trade a, a DJ, but also trained as an academic composer, he brings that into into the mix. You know, so a lot of lot of the audience in the Berlin concert, you know, they're they're his DJ fans. You know, um, we had a great Hong Kong composer writing for us for that one, Lam Lai. And now she she's going into sort of media art and and sort of um, more you know less acad academic <coughs> square box kind of kind of writing which is, which is great you know um, so yeah I mean that that's that's an example where you know the audiences do mix you know because you have academic composition people who come from those crowds and you also have the DJ crowd you know and I think every concert we do there's something like that. You know, we just did a the the dance project with the Guangdong Modern Dance Company in Guangzhou. We just recorded the music for that, and yeah, it was you know there were about five hundred people at that concert, but they were listening to super experimental European avant-garde music. They were mostly all dancers. <laughs> you know, I mean that that's our audience because it it's for a for a, a dance company. You know, it's for a dance audience. But where the crossover happens is where it's most interesting, and where we where, where we do grow an audience, and and actually where the general public can become more aware about what we do, and and you know it's also listening for for us it's about also about listening to our audience, learning what they want. Um, then did you plan any more crossover projects yeah, in the future? 
Yeah, many. It, it's it's many. It it's all crossover basically. I mean, there, there's no such thing. Hong Kong is a, a city of crossover, really. I mean, it's hard to avoid. So we've got more silent film projects, more dance collaborations, um, more multimedia stuff. You know, like with Samson Young. Um, you know, e- even you know presentations of avant-garde music. I mean, I'd, I'm I'm planning a presentation of Rock Rothko's Chapel by Feldman. But actually, to do it in this church in Sai Kung, you know, um, with visuals, so it can actually be, you know, it's an immersive experience. It's it's an, it's it's not the the um, intention to be crossover, but it sort of just happens because it, that's the artistic direc- direction you're going, you know, as a person, as an ensemble, you know, and it, and it, I think it's quite natural being in a place like Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. We live in a very visual you know, a uh, very visual culture, very, you know, stimulated by uh, many different things on, on, in so many different directions, you know. So, yeah, I, I think what we do I- is appropriate for Hong Kong, but we'll be, we'll develop in a different way to, say, an ensemble in Europe, you know, because we have different cultural baggage, you know. Um, and this is when cultural baggage is a good thing. So apart from the next few concerts left in the series, mm-hmm. what are the plans for next year? I'll just give a summary because we've almost run out of time. Um, next year is the 100th anniversary of Rite of Spring, so we've got to do some more tributes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Um, planning a big collaboration with Samson Young, mm-hmm. great Hong Kong um, composer. Um, but we've got two CD releases, hopefully more more um, like DVD releases. If we can put put out this silent film in a sort of DVD release, to actually have more products, you know. As you were saying before, all right, what what does visual art have um, that you know contemporary music doesn't? It's actually product, you know. Mm-hmm. So the more we can offer product and to be able to offer more different opportuni- opportunities for people to take home a piece of sound then that's a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, our focus for the next few years has to be on education, you know, of the musicians around us and also of, of our general audience. So, yeah, we are planning a big educational institute in collaboration with the Goethe Institute and a lot of in-schools programs. So, yeah, too much to put into words, really. <laughs> cool. So thanks for watching today, and this is William Lane, the Artistic Director of the Hong Kong New Music Ensemble, and I'm Seki Shin, the Conductor of the Hong Kong New Music Ensemble. Thanks, and have a nice day. Thanks for listening.